Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our monthly Strengthening Families Networking Webinar. Today, we are focusing on building protective factors in child health services to help me grow. So we're excited to hear from our guest presenters and to hopefully hear from all of you as well about where you see opportunities to do that work in your community. So I'll start with a little bit of housekeeping. My name is Kaylin O'Connor from the Center for the Study of Social Policy. Uh, we do these webinars each month on the second Thursday of the month. And uh, it is an open invitation to anyone who's using the Protective Factors Framework and coordinating strengthening families' efforts, whether that's for a program or agency or a county or a city or a state or a national organization, everyone is welcome. We convene these. Uh, my organization, the Center for the Study of Social Policy, along with our partners at the Children's Trust Fund Alliance. And each month we have a specific topic, usually with a guest speaker, and we welcome uh, volunteers to be the guest speaker if you've got something you'd like to share. And uh, we also have a rich archive of recordings from these past webinars, and if you check within a few days, today's will be up as well. So if you look at this Google site that is maintained by the Alliance, uh, they will post the recording and the slides and any handouts with, that go with the webinar each month. So you can always go there if you miss it or if you just want to browse through to find past topics that we've covered. <clears throat> Excuse me, my slide is not advancing. There we go. So as I said, we do this is the second Thursday of each month at this time. In January, it'll be on the 9th, and the focus will be on building walks for early learning communities. You can register at the link there. You can also look for announcements and registration links that come out in the Strengthening Families e-update newsletter, usually the week before uh, the webinar or sometimes the beginning of that week, which might be the case in January when we're all just getting back from holidays. It's also always the registration link will be on the Alliance's Google site where the recordings are posted as well. I'll also note that today you have, <clears throat> excuse me, a handout in the webinar panel under handouts. There is one of the slides from today, a PDF, so that you can download that if you want the slides um, to share with others or for your own notes. Uh, there is also a handout there about the Early Learning Nation work that we'll focus on next month. So if you want to see what that's all about, get a little sneak preview, um, you can see it there. And we've got some exciting topics coming up for the other months of early 2020. We'll announce those as we go, but maybe just mark on your calendar the second Thursday of the month. And then once you know the topic, you can decide whether to register or not. All right, so our agenda for today, um, I will be uh, sharing a few updates from CSSP. We'll get some updates from the Children's Trust Fund Alliance from Martha Reeder. And then we'll jump into our topic with Erin Cornell, Abby Alter, and Angelina Montgomery. I'll introduce them when we get up to their part of the, <laughs> the agenda. So a couple of, um, excuse me, uh, I got a note from someone that they couldn't hear. I think that was one person's challenge, <laughs> not everyone's. If someone else would have let me know by now if you couldn't hear me. But if you are having audio issues, please let us know and uh, we will see what we can do about it. Um, general tip is if you're connected by phone and you can't hear, try your computer audio. If vice versa, try the other. Um, usually one will work if the other doesn't. So let's continue. I will just share a few updates from our organization, the Center for the Study of Social Policy. We're very excited about the digital tool for becoming an early learning community, which is also what we'll focus on in our webinar in January, as I just mentioned. Um, if you're really curious to find out, you can look it up now at earlylearningnation.com. Uh, click through to the progress rating tool. It's pretty prominent on that website. There's a video about it. And you can go ahead and log in if you like. You can create an account. And if you just want to go in to see what it's all about, you can create an account and attach yourself to the community called Demo Community for Kids um, so that that won't be real data that's attached to your community, but it gives you a chance to you know, see what the tool is all about. If you do think that your community wants to engage in this process, you can sign up to be a community lead and then you do need to send a request and wait for a response back to set that up. And then you can share it with other stakeholders in your community so that they can respond to a survey as well. So we'll go into that in a lot of detail in January as well as making that link to how this all relates to the protective factors and prevention and promotion and all the things that uh, we all care about on these calls. So. I hope you'll join us for that in January. 
Coming soon and related, we will be doing a survey about community protective factors. We know that uh, a lot of folks in the Strengthening Families Network are doing work not just on helping service providers use a strength-based approach, but implementing wider community-level work um, to prevent child abuse and neglect or to promote thriving for children and families. And so we're putting out a survey soon. <clears throat> we have a small sort of ad hoc group working on this. So we'll get a survey out and hope that you will respond to it and also share it with others who you may know who are doing a lot of community level work. And uh, then we'll be doing a literature review and some other work to pursue this idea of community protective factors. But the survey will be our first step. And I hope you will respond to that survey when we get it out. I also wanted to share that uh, we're very excited in 2020, we'll be holding the Together for Families conference for the second time. And this year, well, next year, it will be held in Seattle, October 13th to 16th. This is a conference that CSSP co-hosts with the National Family Support Network, Be Strong Families, and Families Canada. So it's a, this will be the second time we've done this conference. The first one was a huge success, and we are hoping to have even more people and more energy and excitement, uh, although there was a lot of energy and excitement at that first one, but with more people, it'll be even more fun and richer learning. So I hope you'll all be able to join us and we will be sharing more information in early 2020 about how to propose a session. Um, we'll be looking for volunteers to help select which sessions uh, will be used, <laughs> be selected for the conference and hope that lots of you will be engaged in that work with us. All right, I'm going to hand off to my colleague, Martha Reeder, from the Children's Trust Fund Alliance. Thank you, Kaylin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really great to see so many familiar names in the list of attendees today, and I am so glad to be here this afternoon. Can you go to the next slide? I mean, you may have noticed the, the uh, on the PowerPoint template, the new uh, logo for the Alliance. And uh, we just celebrated our 30th anniversary at a wonderful meeting in Washington, D.C., early in November. And uh, we have a new name and a new logo, and it's going to take some getting used to, but um, uh, Kaylin just announced our name as the Children's Trust Fund Alliance. And, and uh, rather than uh, the, what we were formerly known as, the National Alliance of Children's Trust and Prevention Funds. So quite a long name and our new name is a lot easier um, to say and hope that everyone will uh, celebrate with us. We had a great reception there. Uh, it was a wonderful evening and kind of an emotional evening for me because uh, so many of the people I have worked with over the years in the Strengthening Families work were there as our guest and uh, we had a great time of visiting and and re getting reacquainted with people we haven't seen in a long time. So I hope you will look for our new uh, logo and our and uh, remember our new name. Thank you for celebrating with us. Let's look to the next slide, please. Last week uh, we had our fifth annual virtual convening for the Birth Parent National Network. And I'm just bringing this up because um, you can go on our website and uh, access the, the materials from that call. I have a, um, a, a link here where you can download the, those materials. We had some excellent speakers, Bart Klika from uh, Prevent Child Abuse America, had a wonderful um, and very informative uh, hour of time to share about what, what they know is effective in preventing child abuse and neglect, lots of statistics, and I think it'll be something that you really enjoy hearing. Along with um, the other things that you see, uh, Colorado uh, shared their strategy for community-based child abuse prevention and also had one of their excellent parent leaders um, to help present in that. And Andrew Russo um, presented uh, information about family resource centers. And we heard from Kathleen Strader uh, from Healthy Families America um, talking about um, home visiting. So um, I hope you will take advantage of that and take a look at those materials. Uh, let's go to the next slide. 
The Alliance National Parent Partnership Council is really excited to share with you um, that we are launching the Need to Know Partnership Academy. We had an initial um, webinar back in October. It was kind of an introductory and shorter um, uh, webinar just to kind of get people thinking and it was really meant uh, to help parents and organizational partners to think together about what they could do to um, to accomplish the common goals that they have. These uh, uh, Partnership Academy webinars are constructed both for organizational partners and for parent partners. And during the time of the webinar, there will be some activities specifically designed for each uh, group of partners, just for the parent partners, just for the organizational partners, and also activities that, that are designed to be done together. And um, we really see this as a journey of discovery. Uh, at our recent meeting in DC, our uh, council was able to meet face to face for our annual um, Alliance National Parent Partnership Council meeting, and we had a lengthy discussion about how we wanted to see this Partnership Academy unfold. And we just encourage you to get in this journey with us and take this journey along with us. We think that um, it, as it unfolds, there that you can also help shape how that. Um, how that looks. So during the February webinar, our focus will be on bringing our best to the partnership, and we will be exploring specific ways you might want to utilize the ANPPC tool called Creating Effective Parent Partnerships. And if you missed the introductory call, you can download those materials and uh, find this information and the registration link on the Alliance website and I'll put that link in the chat box and you can uh, copy it out of the chat box, uh, the link on our website. So I hope you'll plan to join us um, during February National Parent Leadership Month for the launch of our Partnership Academy. And that's all I have today, Kaylin. Thanks so much, Martha. And congratulations on the 30th anniversary and the new name and logo. Very exciting stuff. Thank you. All right, so uh, we're excited to get to our topic today of building protective factors in child health services to help me grow. Some of you may be very familiar with Help Me Grow already. Some of you may be newer to it. So we'll cover all those bases. Our pre presenters today are Erin Cornell, who's the Associate Director at the Help Me Grow National Center. Abby Alter is a Senior Associate for Early Childhood Initiatives at the Child Health and Development Institute. And um, Angelina, sorry, your name was Blocked for me. Angelina Montgomery is the Help Me Grow Prevention Manager at First Five Alameda County. So we'll be hearing from Erin, Abby, and Angelina. And uh, welcome and thanks for presenting. The floor is yours. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Kaylin. You can actually go to the next slide. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, so this is Erin Cornell. I'm, I'm so appreciative of the opportunity to join you today to share more about Help Me Grow and particularly our experience with the protective factors. I wanted uh, to begin by offering some more context about our work and why the protective factors emerged as a salient framework for those of us engaged with Help Me Grow efforts across the country. And then um, after you hear from me, you'll have the opportunity to hear from uh, our partners about their experience embedding the protective factors framework in pediatric primary care. Next slide. So this is a slide I'm sure that many of you have seen or used. Um, there's, there's really increasing awareness, obviously, about the importance of many factors beyond quality health care that contribute to optimal outcomes for young children. So beyond providing tertiary treatment and intervention, the field, and those of you listening in today in particular, are both championing and embracing a broader view about where and how we can best support families. Next slide. This um, the shift in our thinking requires that we reflect on the importance of the early childhood period in particular. So depending on where you are, where you're listening in from, um, there's different estimates, but generally most evidence suggests that somewhere around 40% of young children enter kindergarten behind in cognitive, social, or behavioral skills. And this is important given how much we know um, early brain development is happening early in life and how significant this early experience will be later on um, in shaping life outcomes uh, across the lifespan. So it's really imperative that we do all we can in this critical period. 
And this combination of trends and our reflection on this broadly suggests that the best approach we can use um, beyond relying on effective traditional treatment and intervention is one that prevents low and medium risk families from becoming high risk. And so I want to talk about one of the ways that we're doing that through Help Me Grow. Uh, next slide. I will say, so the, the, oh, you can actually push the button again because that's going to say our, our creative gears animation will run and potentially slow the, oh, maybe, nope, it's going to stay there as a, as a feature while I talk. So that's good. It, it makes it more animated. Webinars can be a little flat, so we like to keep it lively. Um, so the good news is that um, I think the abundance of investment in early childhood and the growing awareness of how important this period is means that most communities, um, certainly not all, but many have an increasingly large number of programs and services that are designed to meet the needs of young children and families. Uh, while these services are many, the degree to which they're easily navigated and the opportunities for all of these sectors and settings to promote a shared message about child development uh, is challenged by the fact that there really is no overarching system from which all of these services are embedded uh, together. The Help Me Grow system is designed to help states and communities leverage these existing resources and ensure that communities can identify vulnerable young children and families, link families to community-based services, and empower families to support their children's healthy development. We do this through the implementation and coordination across four core components. The first being a centralized access point that's designed to assist families and providers in connecting children to a grid of community resources. Family and community outreach, which is designed to build both parent and provider understanding of healthy child development, of what services are available in the community, and how both knowledge and services are important to improving outcomes. Child Healthcare Provider Outreach, where we'll spend the majority of our time today, supports early detection and intervention and ensures that pediatric providers are embedded in that broader early childhood system. And then to ensure that the grid is working effectively, evaluation and, and data and analysis helps jointly to identify gaps, bolster advocacy efforts, uh, and can also guide quality improvement and you know, refine our approach over time. Next slide. So if we think of all of these resources happening in the community um, operating as a grid, the mission of Help Me Grow is to ensure that families can essentially plug into the grid of these community supports from any point and access the resources that they need in order to thrive. And so in doing this, Help Me Grow doesn't act as a grid, but rather strengthens the resource grid by keeping that resource directory up to date, um, by connecting service providers to each other, and by ensuring that families have uh, support in navigating the system should they desire that support. Next slide. Erin, I'm going to interrupt for a moment. We've had a few people comment that they're having a hard time hearing you. So I don't know if you're able to turn the volume up on your phone or get closer to it. Um, but if you are um, able to increase your volume at all, um, some folks are having a hard time hearing. Sure. Thanks, Kaylin. And I apologize. I am about as close as I can be. So, you know, what I might do, um, I might try to call in from another number because I know when we tested in the beginning, we had some issues too. And I, Abby's going to also use my phone. So I'd rather make sure that if there's an issue, um, I try to fix it now uh, rather than keep talking. Um, so just give me one second to try uh, on my cell phone. Yeah. Okay. Thanks everybody for your patience. Um, I will yeah, explain a couple things um, in the in the webinar while you do that. A few people are saying they can hear well, so <laughs> it's not everyone. Um, uh, just so folks know, you can always type in to the chat box or question box, um, and we can see that. If you have content questions, you can type those in as they occur to you, and we can get to them when there's a time for questions. Um, and I know that Erin's going to pose a couple questions as well uh, for you to think about and perhaps type your answer in. And then when we have opportunities to talk, you can use the raise my hand feature, and we can unmute you if you're in a good place to do that and you'd like to actually speak. Otherwise, you can type it in and we can speak on your behalf. So um, sorry as we take this little um, tech fix moment. Um, I'm not sure what the issues are today. It was um, sounding clear for a lot of people, um, but we want to make sure that everyone can hear. Uh, it looks like Erin is muted. Hold on a second. Um, 
Okay, you'll have to type in your audio pin and then you'll be able to unmute. Okay, Erin, want to try speaking now? We're hearing Can you hear me? Numbers. There we go. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, all right, so tell me, does this sound any better? You sound a lot clearer, or a lot louder, so um, I think we're on the right track. Well, all right, so this is a, this is a notch in the let's use our cell phones uh, for future webinars versus our, our existing uh, telephone equipment. So apologies, everyone, but I'm glad if it sounds better and you're able to hear me. Uh, we do a lot of webinars here, too, and I will say that that was pretty record time for switching over a phone. So, Caitlin, thank you very much for your help and for uh, filling in the gap while we, while we change over. So hopefully everyone can hear me, um, and I'll pick up where I left off, which was talking a little bit about Help Me Grow and how um, it, in strengthening that community resource grid, Help Me Grow is uniquely positioned to do a couple of things, including catalyze cross-sector collaboration, um, provide that critical referral and linkage support that um, is so necessary following identification of child and family level need, and engaging in effective outreach to maximize the degree to which families experience a consistent message about the importance of early childhood development. Next slide. Since its inception in 1997 in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, the Help Me Grow model has been embraced and replicated by states and communities all across the country. So we now have more than 28 states and the network in that way serves as a really vibrant learning community primed to test and uptake new approaches, new ideas, new frameworks. Um, and if you hit the next slide, um, it's going to be a section header that talks a little bit about how we've leveraged our national network specifically uh, to diffuse the protective factors framework. Next slide. So a number of years ago, we, and you can hit the button, there's a little anim animation on this slide, uh, we, through our relationship with the Center for the Study of Social Policy, uh, became familiar with the protective factors framework. It aligned with our belief in the importance of a strength-based approach. It felt relevant to the work that's being led across the country by Help Me Grow affiliates. And we fully embrace the framework in many different aspects of the Help Me Grow model. So for example, um, we worked with CSSP and several of our Help Me Grow communities to apply the protective factors framework to the centralized access points of the model. We did this using um, the program self-assessment tool, which many of you on the line may be familiar with or may have used in the past. Um, this was to explore concepts such as whether uh, program staff within the centralized access point were reinforcing parental authority, um, providing information to parents about what to expect of their children in different stages of development, lots of different uh, workflow and staff strategies to maximize knowledge of parent and child development, children's social emotional competence, all the protective factors. Um, this, this work, um, alongside many other projects, has really given us an opportunity to test and refine our approach. Um, if you click the button, you'll see there's another um, example within our, within our community and family outreach work. Uh, events such as Books, Falls, and Blocks, which is a model created by our Utah affiliate, ensure that Protective Factors is also being brought directly out to families and is not just um, available to those that choose to engage with a centralized access point, but it's something we're also promoting in a proactive way uh, within the community. You can click the button. Our affiliates uh, in Connecticut and Utah also have leveraged a parent-facing survey to assess the degree to which Help Me Grow um, is perceived by parents to increase their knowledge of parenting and child development, importance of social connections, and actually this work of Connecticut and Utah inspired us to build in um, a shared data point across our entire affiliate network that relates to uh, Help Me Grow and concrete support in times of need. Um, so it's even been something we've embedded in our, in our shared measurement approach across all affiliates. And so all of this work led us to recognize that there were important opportunities for us to consider what degree um, we might be able to also embed the protective factors into Help Me Grow's work with child health providers. Next slide. We were, we had an opportunity as, um, thank you, uh, in our, in 2015 with support from the JPB Foundation, uh, the Helmiger National Center embarked on a new initiative that was designed to create and apply three new modules in pediatric primary care. The modules themselves embedded both a training and quality improvement component, 
they were focused on three areas, including child development, which was something that was very obviously near and dear to the heart of Help Me Grow Affiliates. We've been doing that work for many years. That provided a foundation to build out from to address both family mental health and also this concept of protective factors, which you'll hear much more about um, as we go on. Next slide. Our project required us to develop and vet content for each of the modules and to design and test quality improvement metrics for the protective factors, which was really fascinating work. And Abby, we're, Abby will share more about the module development and the metrics that we use. And as partners in this work, we also engaged three communities across our Home network. Uh, that included Alameda, Vermont, and Connecticut. And you'll hear more about Alameda County's experience in the project today from Angelina in just a bit. And overall, I think we spent a little under a year engaged in the protective factors work, which provided a lot of lessons learned that we will reflect on toward the end. Next slide. And last slide. Lastly, and briefly, um, at the start of this work, we, we wanted to survey our participating practices about their level of training in each of these areas, uh, including protective factors and also toxic stress. Uh, you know, so you can see the results here. There's a pretty small sample size. This is just our group of physicians. It's not really revelatory from the standpoint of their results. Um, it, it mostly matched what we expected, which was that there wasn't a lot of training. Um, there was an overwhelming familiarity among practices when we started in a lot of these areas, and in particular around protective factors and toxic stress. But what was interesting, and I, I put this here as a plant for hopefully some, some further reflection as we go on in the presentation, was that we had viewed um, protective factors and toxic stress as two very different components to, to talk to practices about. We framed them differently. We asked about their baseline familiarity as different things. Um, but, you know, we wondered over the course of the project if perhaps we were treating those two topics as a little too distal from one another. Uh, next slide. So something we'd like to um, kind of dive into a little bit more at the end, if there's time, uh, would be actually your thoughts and ideas about whether there's an opportunity to better blend um, kind of the outpouring of public awareness and research on both positive child experiences and adverse child experiences. We know that many families that experience ACEs and toxic stress um, actually don't go on to exhibit negative outcomes despite their high risk. And we know that protective factors play a buffering role. And so as you'll go on to hear later in the presentation, many of our practices actually themselves saw their relationship here and brought that up as we pose questions about the feasibility and practicality of protective factors. Um, so I'm just putting this question out here now so you can give it more thought uh, before we get to the Q&A. And it's my pleasure now to turn it over to Abby who will share my cell phone so that we do not avoid or uh, get back into the technical issues we had before. And Kaylin, I'm hoping if, if this wasn't better, you would have said something um, because we can also try, we could always try a third phone and set a, set a record today. <laughs> so hopefully you can still hear you, us. Okay. You, have, you have sounded really good. So I, I think Abby will too. Thank you for your flexibility. Oh yeah, no, of course. All right. Here's Abby. Hi everyone. And thanks Erin and thanks Kaylin. Um, I am happy to be here and just wanted to let you know I have a terrible cold, so if I cough in the middle of this, I'll take some water and just, I apologize to everybody in advance. Um, but as Erin was saying, you can actually skip this slide. Um, we're, well, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about, and um, my colleague Angelina, who's going to come after me, is going to talk about a specific experience that we had um, in, with her practices in California. But I'm going to be talking about how we, um, introduce protective factors as a concept um, to mitigate toxic stress and build resilience in pediatric practices. And first I wanna talk a little bit about why, do, why would you focus on developing relationships with child health providers? I, I'm sure a lot of you know already that um, child health providers are a really big important, uh-oh, are we getting, okay, good. It's a big important um, component of the early childhood system. And one of the main reasons is that there's near universal utilization of child health services. We know that parents um, take their children to the pediatrician at least at least five or six times in the first year. Um, so it does give providers that near universal access to parents, um, helps develop a longitudinal relationship with those families. It's, a tr it's usually a trusted relationship if the provider is building a medical home with that family. And we, we also um, like to talk about resources and important services that providers can offer to families. And it's a perfect opportunity to do that in states that, that offer programs like Help Me Grow. Okay, next slide, I think, yep, okay. 
so I, today I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a program that we um, have in my agency called the Child Health and Development Institute, um, and we are the um, we act as Connecticut um, affiliates. We are the provider outreach component, basically, of Connecticut's Help Me Grow affiliate. Um, local affiliate here, which is a little different than the national center, but we also have a Connecticut affiliate. And what this program is, we call it Educating Practices, and we offer 21 training topics to pediatricians um, and family, family medicine sites across Connecticut. Uh, we use a model called an academic detailing model, which was based on pharmaceutical outreach. And what we do is we bring, uh, we have a personal visit by a trained person um, to health professionals and their entire staff, including their frontline staff. We invite everyone and really require that everyone comes so um, that there's buy-in from everyone involved in any kind of practice change that we're trying to have happen in the practices. Um, and we offer it in their setting. So we'll bring lunch or breakfast or whatever the case may be. They're also free um, and they're pretty short. We try to book 45 minutes to an hour, but we have to sometimes do things in 15 to 20 minutes. And our um, speakers are very, very skilled in presenting what the providers really need to know to sort of get through this. Um, they're, they're trained, really the trainings are tailored to connect practices to existing state and community resources. Um, um, they usually include information about clin both clinical information as well as um, local um, helpful resources and tools that they can offer um, to providers. And as the Connecticut um, provider outreach component, we often bring Help Me Grow materials. Um, there's also something we're going to be talking a lot about today, which is our practice quality improvement piece. That is another type of provider outreach tool that um, could be used offering maintenance of certification credits. So next slide. So let me tell you a little bit about the maintenance of certification before I actually go in to tell you how we diffuse the protective factors in practices. Um, but, so I can give you a little introduction before I actually go into the details. So maintenance of certification, and I learned that some states call it mock, which I think is very cool, but I, we don't say that in Connecticut, so I'm probably just gonna say MOC, but some states call it mock. Um, it's basically a continuous process of learning, self-assessment, and clinical improvement. And in pediatrics, the American Board of Pediatrics re does require um, a four-part maintenance of certification process for providers to maintain board certification. And there is something in the maintenance of certification um, called part four, which is the, the key that is the emphasis on quality improvement. Um, and what it does is it, it provides support to providers and practices um, to meet this requirement um, to identify and improve um, timely and relevant um, quality improvement activities or modules. Um, and in Connecticut, we do have um, an existing practice in, uh, improvement program, PQI, we also use the acronym, um, which utilizes an online database. So I'm gonna show you um, an example of that later with the, related to the protective factors, but the, the point of it is that it's really nice for practices to see their improvement over time through charting that they can see through a database run chart. Next slide, please. So in practice quality improvement, um, some of you are probably are familiar with it, um, but at least in our program here in Connecticut, um, we have three important questions that we're trying to ask. So what is the practice trying to accomplish? How will they know when a change is an improvement? And what changes can we make that will result in the improvement? And we do that through a process called PDSA, which is short for Plan, Do, Study, Act. And actually, each month when providers do the actual quality improvement work, they're actually also assessing um, how they planned or test the observation, including a plan for how they collected data. Um, they're, they're telling us um, how they tried it out. Um, they're looking at what they did to analyze the data. And then they're kind of telling us, um, well, what can you do now to refine the change based on what you learned from the test? So um, it's, it's a really nice. Um, way to look at um, feasibility and success across uh, an improvement project. So now, let me tell you, next slide please, yes. So now I'd love to tell you a little bit about our protective factors project that we did, as Erin mentioned, with um, three affiliates um, 
I'll, we'll get to that a little later, but Connecticut, California, and Vermont. And so how the project looked, just to give you a really quick and dirty um, review of the project, because it is pretty complex, was that we had six practices, two in each community. Each um, was responsible for implementing, with their practices, a 45-minute training module, which is what I talked about before, the Educating Practices module, which we developed. Um, this module was called Strengthening the Protective Factors to Mitigate the Effects of Toxic Stress, the Role of the Pediatric Practice. And in addition to attending this uh, module, um, the practices had to commit to one of those PQI quality improvement projects, um, which did offer MOC credit to the practices. And we spent a long time. So as you, many of you are probably familiar with the strengthening practice um, framework, we struggled a little bit in trying to figure out, well, how, how can we diffuse this in pediatrics? You know, what's the most tangible way? you know, what kind of actions can we expect providers to do? And, and we worked pretty hard on that. Um, and what we came up with, um, we learned a lot, and you'll see some of the results. But I think we were forging new ground in the sense that providers, at least in Connecticut and in the other areas, had not really been asked to do anything like this before in relation to um, protective factors questioning. So we thought, well, what could we do? We could ask the providers to document that they had certain discussions with the patients related to each protective factor. And we thought, obviously, it would be important to focus on the first year of life um, during well-child visits, because um, as we know, that those are um, most likely visits that parents will attend. Um, the, our goal, really, was to have providers document that they've discussed at least two to three protective factors per visit. Um, we also were looking for the providers, um, once they had these conversations, if anything came out or resonated for the families, that they would document if there was a need for a referral to help me grow. In addition to asking providers to document, we also asked, we also thought, wouldn't it be interesting to find out what does it look like across practices? Like, what, how are families feeling as a result? of working with these providers about their knowledge about um, the protective factors. So we, in addition, um, developed a parent caregiver, what we called an exit survey. And I'm gonna tell you how we implemented that as well. So you can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, so before we went out and did this module, um, we had to make sure, just like anything we do in our educating practices, project is that um, there are resources and since we were using working very closely with help me grow affiliates the affiliates had to have their central access points prepared um, but before we even did that we had to prepare the module and normally what we do to prepare a module is we consult with experts so we utilize research from cssp and i know caitlin caitlin i'm sorry um, helped us with that, and we did a lot of research on the uh, protective factors on your website and used lots of your resources. We also consulted with Connecticut Children's Center for Care Coordination staff who were actually trained from the former National Alliance of Children's Trust and Prevention Funds, which is now the Alliance, I'm not gonna say that correctly, but um, who helped us develop the module um, based on um, a project they have done and some training that they had done. We then take the module and we field test it in a, in a local pediatric office. And as I said before, we asked each of the Help Me Grow affiliates to make sure that their sites um, and their central access points um, would have information that could support these discussions. Because we never want to ask providers to talk to families um, about anything that they don't have a resource for. You know, we, we never want to leave them that way. So for example, if a family was like, well, yes, I'd really love to get out more and, and make, meet more parents or meet more um, mothers and fathers with children, we were asking the Help Me Grow affiliates to have information on library classes or other community support. So that's just an example. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so you might be wondering how in the world <laughs> we could do something like this and how could how could we frame it so that providers had something tangible to do we often like to in these quality improvement programs have the providers implement some kind of practice change and some kind of um, practice um, sometimes it has to do with implementing a screening tool but in this case we thought well we could ask 
we could come up with a proxy for each protective factor and have the providers think about a way that they can start these conversations. So we came up with a guide, and I want to just stress, and you'll see in a minute, how each, um, pra each of the practices throughout the affiliates, we, we kind of all did it a little differently in the end. But um, what we really came up with was that these were starting points. So for example, um, for the for the protective factor parent, parental res I can't talk today I'm sorry parental resilience um, we came up with a, a question something like how do you handle stress when you're faced with the challenges of parenthood and we did allow sites to um, add on to that or tweak it or change it but that was really the crux of where we were going so for social connections we have do you have a support system in your life and you may be saying oh well that's you know that's just one piece of the protective factor and we know that and believe me we struggled with is that enough is that a start but we did think we we were testing this this was all a test so um and you'll see what we found was pretty interesting for knowledge of parenting and child development that one was a little bit clearer um because providers are very used to asking you know how's your child feeding how are they growing you know they're measuring their weight and their, you know, head circumference, how are they sleeping and playing? A lot of these are happening in the normal course of a well child visit. The harder ones, um, something like concrete support in times of need, we thought they could open up a starter question like, do you know where to ask for help if you needed it? Um, and then for the social emotional competence of children, which is a very big topic area, um, and we probably thought a lot about this one internally at my agency, um, spent many of days in our offices um, arguing about what was the right question and and you'll see that this one's a struggle but how do you comfort your child when he or she is upset and we thought that that was sort of one way of building resilience and building the social emotional capacity of children so just so i just want to emphasize that these were a guide for practices um, in thinking of how could i start these conversations next slide please how am I on time? Oh, I have to hurry. Okay. So in addition, I did talk a little bit about the follow-up survey um, that we did with parents. Um, and again, we reflected back to parents and asked them to rate on a, on a Likert scale if they agreed or, um, or strongly disagreed about the different statements related to each um, protective factor. And we also asked them their opinion about if they needed help, did they get the help? Did they get a referral for help they grow? So this is um, a little bit um, just for providing you information and I'll tell you later how you can find out more about this survey. Next slide. I have to hurry so we give Angelina a chance. Okay. Um, so just quickly, um, as I said, it turned out, we didn't really plan it this way, but it is the nature of working in pediatrics. Each pediatric practice is going to have to make a practice change work for their workflow. So what we found was that in Connecticut, um, the practices, in order to implement protective factors, they actually added a question to their pre-visit questionnaires for their well-child visits. And that question was, whom can you count on to help and support you? Um, the parent exit surveys they gave out by, with, um, through a medical assistant who was in charge of giving it out and collecting it. And I'm, I'm going to say that it was a little bit of a challenge um, because that person changed over time in the practice and it's just the nature of um, when you're dealing with giving out surveys to families. In Vermont, we found that Vermont, um, who worked very largely with a refugee population, was actually in the middle of doing a social determinants of health project. And the way they looked at it was, well, they were already asking families about the social determinants. Why don't we just see if we can add some of the protective factors with that tool? Um, and they just couldn't give out the parent exit survey um, due to staffing issues. And then in California, which Angelina is going to tell you a lot more about, is that one practice um, decided to use the actual the parent exit survey as a pre-visit tool to open the discussion. So sort of instead of giving it out after, they kind of gave it out before and then used that as talking points. Um, another practice that we worked with in California um, put the um, responsibility on the pediatric providers for asking the questions, and it was up to them to update their electronic medical record to document. Um, but one thing I do want to point out, which is kind of what Erin framed as a question for everybody, was that what we found as we started working with practices is that really practices kept coming back to this concept of ACEs screening. And why, why can't we just do an ACEs screening for this? You know, um, that's what we want to do. And we kept coming back and saying, well, they're different. You know, they're a little bit different and obviously they're related. 
So that's just something I want to keep as a theme throughout this um, webinar with you. And also, obviously, the social determinants of health screening as a bridge to um, protective factors discussion. Next slide. Oh my God, I'm taking up all the time. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is just an example for you to see what our um, practice quality improvement. Um, this is what an actual provider would get after they enter chart data at the end of um, a practice quality improvement project with us. And this is this is actually from the protective factors module. This one was about do you have whether or not it's not so much that they got the answer to the question is that did they document in their chart that they had this discussion and the discussion was do you have a support system in your life and as you can see in the beginning of month one in the project providers were not asking that as frequently but by by the end we saw an uptake in asking that question and we're very excited about that next slide On the other hand, we found that practices did struggle with some of the protective factors. Um, and I think it was a comfort level on like, how do you start these conversations and, and how do you have time to have these conversations? So you can see, how do you comfort your child when he or she is upset? There was not a lot of documentation in the beginning of the project. There was a little bit of a rise, but then we saw it fall down again. And I really do believe it's because providers either um, you know, don't feel comfortable or they don't know how to start these conversations or they, we, we don't really know if they may have had this conversation, but we don't know if they just didn't document it and they may not have had it in the form that we were requiring them. They may have talked a lot about how the parent interacts with their child, but it just didn't come out in this way. Okay, next slide. I think I'm almost done. And okay, so if you really wanna learn, if you're dying to learn much more about this project, we actually wrote an impact paper and um, it has the entire methodology, it has all the results, it has everything you need to know. So if you need to get this, um, it's on our website, it's on the chdi.org website, the link is here, but you can also just go to the website. <laughs> There's my cough. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Angelina, and she um, is gonna talk to you next. Thank you, Abby. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I am um, Angelina, and I'm gonna talk about our experience with implementing this project in Help Me Grow Alameda County in California. Uh, next slide. Just as a brief sort of overview um, about our community, um, I, as, you know, as Aaron mentioned, there are many states across the nation who have taken Help Me Grow as a statewide efforts, but in California, we have a county by county um, uh, approach. So I work in Alameda County, which is the little red county there that you can see on the map. And we are the seventh largest county in the state and the fourth most racially diverse. And we've had, we have um, the latest data shows that we had about 19,000 births in our county in 2013. We were launched as a Help Me Grow affiliate in 2011, which was a natural fit to some programming that was already available um, as part of First Five Alameda County, which is our home agency. And um, through Help Me Grow, we have an extensive pediatric provider outreach and technical assistance program and network. And currently we partner with 58 pediatric uh, practices in the county, and those are all Medi-Cal serving practices and um, we support those um, pediatric providers to implement developmental screening um, using uh, the ages and stages questionnaire, the ASQ, and the modified checklist for autism and toddlers, the MCHAT. And our providers are um, all using the screenings at different AAP recommended intervals. And uh, last year, our last fiscal year, we collected about 15,000 screens from providers that were conducted on um, children. With, with families, and um, so there are about almost around 10,000 ASQs and a little over 5,000 MCHATs. And we had um, uh, about 2,000 families were referred by providers back to our Help Me Grow for services and support in that last fiscal year. Uh, next slide. And I heard that this network discussed the Project Dulce in a recent webinar. Um, so I wanted to let you know how we are partnering with uh, Project Dulce in our county. 
there is a, currently a Project Dual Safe site here in Alameda County through our Highland um, Health Center, which is also a HelpMaker pediatric partner. So um, they receive HelpMaker technical assistance and training around developmental screening, and they utilize us for referrals. So we already have an established relationship with their pediatric um, department. So. Um, our Help Me Grow staff participate in the monthly Dulce um, case conference meetings. So our staff are there to um, provide child development and navigation expertise, um, some information about resources that are available um, and that might be useful for the Dulce navigator. And um, on some occasions, we've actually been a bridge person for Dulce and for other resources, like if the family needed support around immigration or legal support, um, we are able to help be a bridge for um, the Dulce navigator. And um, since families being served by Dulce, uh, are receiving that in-depth family navigation. It doesn't always make sense for them to send a family to help me grow for that extra support, but we are um, uh, sometimes used as a referral source for siblings um, that are maybe not the main client of the Dulce Navigator. So that's kind of how um, we as Help Me Grow have partnered with Project Dulce um, here in our county and have been a support for them and they've been a support for us. Next slide. Now, um, as Abby mentioned, along with the, um, the two other sites that were part of this um, toxic stress research project, um, Help Me Grow Alameda County was chosen um, to participate, and we had two um, clinics who joined us in this research project. Um, one was the Clinica de la Raza Transit Village Clinic, which has a mostly Spanish-speaking population, and Asian Health Center, which has a mostly Chinese and Vietnamese-speaking population. And both locations are located in Oakland, and both are federally qualified health centers. Um, they both participated in the training developed by Abby's team with some additions, uh, where we kind of provided pediatricians examples of how to um, sort of frame the questions and introduce the concept for a specific protective factor, um, which we hoped would help the provider feel a little bit more comfortable about asking the questions and explain to the parent why they're asking the questions, so they're justifying it a little bit. Um, an example of this could be for let's for concrete supports in times of need. Um, we suggest that a provider could open the door by saying something like, a lot of our patients are telling me that they're having a rough time with rent or getting enough food to eat. And then they can explain why it's important for them to know that by saying, like, all of these stresses can really impact how we parent being a mom and dad. And then after scaffolding that question with this um, sort of background information, they could then ask, so where do you go when you need help or do you need any resources? So it's um, providing the, the kind of narrative and language around, um, around it to help a provider see how, um, you know, not only how valuable it is for them to know that information, but um, help them explain to a parent why they might be asking this question that they don't typically ask in their visit. So similarly with the other two sites, um, each site was required to, you know, collect the post-visit post family survey and enter data and have monthly team meetings. Next slide. So challenges, um, after implementing this module, we ran up against a few challenges. Uh, one of those was, as has been previously mentioned, that, that um, you know, although both of our practices were FQHCs, and some pediatricians did feel like the questions they were asking around things like concrete supports and supporting knowledge of child development already fit into their usual narrative, um, and what they are normally, you know, familiar with helping families with. Um, some providers did have a harder time incorporating other questions, um, like the social connections questions or around par uh, parental resilience or social emotional competence, which is very clear in the data that Abby, um, Abby, you know, talked about earlier. And um, since we didn't prescribe which question to ask specifically, as you notice in the data, many pediatricians just went with what was sort of the easiest. Um, and also, uh, this module was not really valued sort of as a quote-unquote intervention, so to speak, by the pediatricians. They wanted something more tangible, like passing out a survey that they could hand out, um, not just asking these prevention questions. You know, our medical, communi medical community is very familiar with conducting surveys and, and doing treatment, but um, sometimes prevention is just a tough sell. And finally, the post-visit survey was a really big challenge, um, as Abby mentioned before. Um, that, you know, one of our clinics found that doing the survey after the visit was a problem because families could fill out that 
they needed, you know, help with all of the protective factors, but they had already left and the provider couldn't do anything about it. And the survey was supposed to be anonymous, so that also meant that they didn't know who that person was, and this actually happened. So um, the providers um, then at La Clinica, one of our sites, uh, decided to use it as a pre-survey. And this allowed the pediatrician to feel like they were asking the protective factors questions that they were supposed to ask without actually having to ask them out loud, and then address the ones that the parents um, reported actually needed addressing. Next slide. I'm sorry if I'm running fast, I just saw the time. Uh, so for practice change, although some pediatricians felt they already knew which protective factors they were most comfortable asking and talking about, um, and they also felt like asking a lot of the questions were awkward, um, other pediatricians, after you know practicing this muscle and getting used to asking the questions in the first place, felt that they really did learn more about their clients and their situations. Uh, we had one example at the Asian Health Services um, that said that they um, they asked about social connections and found that one of the parents of their patients had just had an important adult in their life pass away and were feeling, feeling like they needed some support around strengthening this protective factor. And the provider recognized that, you know, he felt super awkward about asking it, um, but then that he wouldn't have learned that about their um, about his patient if he didn't ask the question. So he did find value in doing it in the end. Um, and secondly, using the survey as a pre-survey instead of a post-survey allowed pediatricians to ask parents about their needs before they entered the room and then discuss with them if any needs arose. Um, and allowed them to act immediately if someone did say they needed help in something specific um, instead of finding out after the visit. And then uh, thirdly, um, pediatricians were more on board with using the survey as their actual intervention um, and following up and acting on the results of the survey um, instead of just being asked to inquire about protective factors more genuine, generally. Um, and, you know, since rolling this out, I've taken a few trainings on adult learning, and I really wish if I had more time, I would have spent more time with them and practicing the questions and having them frame how they would ask it and think about how to work it out, work it into, um, into their visit. Um, I think that would have really helped them um, feel more comfortable with, with implementing um, in their normal well-child visits. And I think if we had prescribed some of the questions for them to ask in specific, we could have practiced those specific ones and then also allowed them time to build that into their EHR, which was something that they did request a little bit of support around. And then finally, going through this module did expand um, what the pediatricians knew to um, refer to Help Me Grow for. So they really thought we were just the agency that could support families around child development. But after learning that we support families with all of these different variety of protective factors that can build and support a family, um, they then could see all the different things they could refer families to us for and it increased their referrals for those other things. Next slide. Um, and then finally, uh, as many of you know, our um, first California Surgeon General, Nadine Burke Harris, um, has championed making space in the budget for pediatric trauma screening. And starting on January 1st, 2020, uh, pediatricians will be able to bill Medi-Cal, um, our Medicaid program in California for trauma screening one time a year for children. Um, there are plans and funding for statewide training. There's a two hour webinar available on acesaware.org. And you can see the tool that has been um, approved. It's called the PEARLS tool. And, um, you know, we hope that Help Me Grow will be able to support providers in our county who are going to start screening, both as a place for them to continue to send families who need support and resources, and hopefully as a training source. And we'd really like to incorporate, you know, some sort of training that will include both ACEs screening and the protective factors to ensure that there's this lens of resilience that's included in every interaction with a parent. Because we know that ACEs are not a death sentence and, and that protective factors are a way that caregivers can really buffer our child's experience and mitigate the impact of toxic stress. So building this messaging into screening and referring process for patients um, and for parents is really key to the success of this intervention. Next slide. Great. Um, thanks, Angelina. This is this is Erin again. And um, Kaylin, just in the interest of time, I will say most of the themes that are on this slide have mostly come up. 
Um, I think you heard, you know, great uh, reactions and, and reflections from both Abby and Angelina about the actual experience. So um, with just a minute left, I did want to I, I did want to give it back to you to either decide you have time for a question or two or kind of wrap us up. Um, but thank you both Abby and Angelina for sharing that. Um, and there's our contact information if there's more questions or if things that we've shared, you know, generated more ideas than we have time to discuss today. Uh, we're also happy to connect offline. Thank you all, and um, I, I do appreciate, I know we lost a couple minutes there with the audio issues. Um, we had a couple, we, the one content question that came in was about who's doing the protective factors and toxic stress trainings for the providers, um, and I think, Abby, you addressed um, sort of how you put together that training, but um, if you have, if you can take a few seconds to explain who actually delivered that training at the different sites, that would be helpful. Sure, for this project, um, we did a train the trainer. So I modeled the um, module for the affiliates and the, um, the, the provider outreach um, Help Me Grow affiliates were responsible for going then to the practices, um, which they had already gone to with two other modules. So this was the third in, in a series. Um, so they kind of had, come, you know, they were comfortable doing that. But usually when we do um, these type of modules, we try to get either a, a peer, a pediatrician or a nurse practitioner or someone who is an expert in the actual topic. Um, but in this case, we kind of became experts in this particular topic. And it was just the way we um, utilized the Help Me Grow framework in order to um, diffuse the module. Is that helpful? Great. Yeah, that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Okay, well, I want to thank. Um, Aaron, Abby, and Angelina for sharing your experiences. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined us today, especially those who had the audio problems. Thanks for your patience. I think we've covered a lot of good ground today, and I'm excited um, that you know folks might take this and think about it with their own Help Me Grow partners or with other physician partners, um, just to think about how physicians can be addressing protective factors. So thank you all very much. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, happy holidays as we're getting into that season, and we will talk again in January. Thanks, everybody.